Okay, welcome everyone to session two, which will be about modeling and monitoring approach of a metaform. Uh, Begonia has already introduced me. My name is Jorgen Kaiber and I'm working at LTU. We have a total of four presentations. And for all of you who participate in the previous section, you will see that there are some connections to that one uh, when you hear the presentation that you hear now. Uh, I will introduce speaker by speaker and we go, go, we go through all the presentations and then in the end we will open the questions and answer section. So please add your uh, questions as soon as you have, have them. And then yeah, in the end I will distribute the questions uh, along the presenter as well as I can. So the first speaker is actually myself. So I will then uh, ask someone to share my presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, the, the title of the presentation is Experimental and Numerical Methods for Edge Cracking and Crash Worthiness Prediction. And the outline is basically uh, three parts. The first one is a short introduction. Then we go through some slides about edge cracking modeling. And finally, uh, some slides about crash worthiness, both in terms of experiments and <clears throat> modeling. Uh, so just a, a brief in introduction here. And uh, many high thing steels have, of course, very attractive uh, properties, but unfortunately, some grades are associated to crack related problems. So typically, uh, newer high thing trees have, besides a very high strength, also fairly good uh, ductility, but uh, they are also sometimes sensitive to cracking. And cracking can, as you can see on the slides here, appear, for example, during a uh, cold forming, but it could also appear, for example, uh, in this case for uh, some kind of a crash box, you can see the cracks are forming under impact loading. And what has been found is that um, conventional tensile properties is insufficient to describe the, the crack uh, the stability of the high strength steels. So therefore, the concept of fracture toughness is considered. So uh, this part of the presentation about edge crack and modeling is a contribution from uh, Ricardo Hernandez, which, which is a researcher at Arucat. So in order to handle crack formation during forming, we need some failure and damage models. In this case, we will use a damage model implemented in the finite element called uh, Abacus. And the damage is actually controlled by a single parameter, uh, D in this case, starting at zero. And when it reaches unity, uh, failure occur and the element will be eroded from the finite element model. And usually this uh, damage parameter is characterized from ordinary tensile tests. You can see the uh, stress strain curve to the left in the presentation. And as you can see there at some point, typically at the maximum uh, stress level, uh, the damage starts and it will go down. It goes to uh, unity and then the element is eroded. However, in this case, the concept of uh, fracture toughness is used. And we will therefore consider the essence of work of fracture experiments that was presented during uh, session one. So uh, here you can see how this inverse uh, approach is working. And as an input, we have the a center work of fracture uh, tests. And uh, you can see in the middle of the presentation, you have uh, some force displacements uh, graph occurs. And the center work of, of a fracture is based on double edge notched uh, specimens. And to the left, you can see the final element model of these uh, tests. And by uh, varying the damage, until the response from the model fits to the experimental curve, then you can say that the final damage criterion is found. So it could look like in something that you can see to the right in the, on the slide. So 
So uh, when the model is uh, calibrated, you, you need some kind of validation. And uh, here we have two, I would say, well-known tests. We have the half specimen dome test, and we have also the whole expansion test. And uh, in both cases, you can see this is a comparison between if you only use uh, standard formal limit diagrams, and also if you combine both the formal limit diagrams with this de calibrated damage model. And as you can see for the specimen dome test, you can see without any damage criterion based on this EVF test, you won't have any failure. But if you see in the, in the middle there, there is a, a crack on this uh, dome. And the, that is something that you can cover if you use uh, the damage model. So you can see in the, in the finite element model results, you see there is a, a crack appearing. And it's exactly the same for the whole expansion tests. Uh, without any formal limit diagram, with only the formal limit diagram, you have no failure. But if you include the EVF uh, results, you will see that you have some uh, eroding elements. And this is a validation for a, a real component the, formed by Fiat. And as you could see in the image, there is a, a crack, an edge crack appearing there to the right of this form part. And once again, without a uh, formal limit diagram, you, won't, you can only have the inner crack, but it's impossible to actually um, predict the edge crack. So once again, there is a very good reason to include the concept of fracture toughness when you're interested to uh, predict edge cracking. And then we have crash burners in terms of experiments and modeling. Uh, I have divided this section into three parts. We have calibration experiments, a modeling part, and in terms of performance and crash tests. And uh, finally, you have the crash tests uh, where the modeling is validated. So first of all, uh, when it comes to modeling, you need to calibrate uh, proper models. And in this case, because crash is something that, that uh, happens at high deformation rate, you need some kind of uh, a rate dependent flow stress model. And you also need a fa failure criterion because it's usually very high uh, deformation involved. In this case, we, have, we will use a method developed here at LTU. It's called step as modeling method. And the good thing with this method is to get the hardening behavior from initial yielding beyond neck and all the way, way to final fracture. And this testing is performed at various stress states. And it works both isotropic and anisotropic materials. Uh, next is modeling modeling of part performance and input here will of course be the calibrated models. And also in this case, we will include a damaged model similar to the one uh, that we use for edge cracking. In this case, we will base uh, the calibration of the damage model of EVF test, but this EVF test has been performed here at LTU at high strain rates. So it fits better for uh, uh, problems with high strain rates involved. So if you look at um, calibration experiments, once again, a rate dependent process model is needed. And as you could see with this stepwise model method, we will use a different uh, uh, specimen geometries. And by using different stress uh, specimen geometries, you will achieve a uh, different state of stress. And you could see here, this method is also um, based on digital image correlation. So what you get in the end is what you can see to the upper right. You will get uh, flow stress curves from initial yielding up to final fracture. And in this ex example, the failure strain became around 0.4 for a certain geometry. And you will also get uh, data for to calibrate a failure criterion, as you could see in the image to the bottom right there you have uh, the failure strains at different traxalities. And uh, 
the step one model method, the nice thing here is that uh, you can characterize materials directly from experiments. You don't need any final element analysis or inverse modeling. Uh, and this could be used from low to high strain rates. So it means put a static condition to a couple of hundred. We can use it from low room temperature to elevated temperatures. And I won't go in, into all details, but uh, what you do here is you, you calculate the strain increment at the most strange region for a certain uh, specimen. And then you compute the stress tensor with rate of return method. And the current yield stress is described by the piecewise linear relation with the current Harley modulus. And based on that, you could compute the resulting tensile force. And then you calculate the residual force, meaning that you take the computed force minus the experimental force. And then you update the Harley modulus and you go through this uh, procedure until a certain tolerance. And that you do step by step. So in then, if you look at the, the figure called final Harlan curve, you can see you will have a piecewise linear plastic curve. But besides having this uh, curve, you also get um, the fracture stain, fracture stain for the certain uh, specimen. And you also get the track the evolution. Then if it won't be just a single wedge, you have how it varies along the test. Oh, so this is just a brief summary. You need uh, a number of different uh, specimen geometries resulting in different traxalities. You get the failure strain, so you can calibrate the failure criterion, and you also get the flow stress curve all the way up to failure. And as you can see, if you want to read more about this method, we have two publications. So, and in the frame of form planet, uh, we took this method one step further. But from the very beginning, it was uh, uh, developed for isotropic material, but we took it one step further. And uh, nowadays, it's also suited for anisotropic uh, materials. So, so here you can see the flow steps curve obtained by using this method. And if you want to read more, please check the, the the article you have the reference in in the the what we know in the presentation. So, if we then go to the validation uh, part, and uh, at LTU we have a high speed uh, tensile testing machine that we're of course using for all the high speed tensile tests. We use it for EVF test at high strain rate, and we also use it in compression, for example, of crash boxes. So in this case, we're performing dynamic component testing. And you can see to the right, you have a crash box prepared with speckles. So if you, you add two high-speed cameras and uh, we use the DIC software, we will be able to, uh, besides detecting crack when they appear, we can also measure the, the plastic strength, how they evolve during the compression. So here you have a comparison between the model results and the uh, experimental results. To the right, you could see what happens with the crash box after approximately 20 meter of 20 millimeter of intrusions. Once again, the input is the calibrate material model, and we also have added a damage model based on fracture toughness. And uh, you can see it's, it agrees fairly well with the uh, the strain uh, obtained in the real experiments. It's the same um, color scale in both. And as you can see in the middle, uh, you have uh, load versus intrusion for free uh, tests compared to the simulation. And I would say they agree fairly well, but as he, what, you can, what we found is that we underestimated the energy absorption in our uh, model. And this is how it looks after 70 millimeter of infusion. It's more or less the same behavior. It agrees fairly well if you compare uh, the measured strain distribution with the 
computer one. But what typically happens is that you have some kind of the correlation because you, it's, it's the deformation is too severe on the crash box. So this is just a magnification what happens. Um, and if you, this is also at 70 millimeter of intrusion. And as you could see in the image to the right, um, you can see that you have a crack formation in the model, but it's, uh, I don't, I, I would have to say it's, you, you don't detect the same crack uh, in the real component. So that's what we think is the reason for uh, underestimating the, the energy absorption. So the material was in reality a little bit better than what our model were showing. So to conclude this uh, presentation, uh, we will say that the duct ductile damage uh, model worked fairly well for edge cracking, but it is recommended to combine it with another criteria, for example, the four millimeter diagram. We think that the, the use of the step as model method works well for the flow step stress description from initial yielding all the way to failure. And uh, when it comes to adding or using the fracture toughness concept based on this EVF test to calibrate, for example, uh, a damage model, both in Abacos or in Alice Dynas, in, uh, in our case, uh, we think it will be the future work will be in some way be able to introduce to use this fracture toughness value directly into the uh, a material model instead of using an inverse modeling procedure. So I think that was my uh, last slide. So Mattia Friedman is a diploma engineer in mechanical engineering. He works as a group leader for integrated data acquisition at Fraunhofer, and he has a long-term experience in sheet metal forming. The title of his presentation is Inline Monitoring Techniques Adapted to the Metal Former Requirements. So, uh, Mr. Rimmer, please go ahead with our presentation. Thank you, Jürgen, for your kind introduction. Dear lady and gentlemen, I cordially welcome you to my presentation with the title Inline Monitoring Techniques Adapted to Sheet Metal Forming Requirements. And in the next Yes, few minutes, I want to give you an overview about uh, the major results regarding this topic we achieved in the form planet project. I think the slide, I moved the slide at the moment. Um, so now you will see my agenda. <clears throat> I will start with a short introduction and then I want to go in detail uh, about two uh, methods we, we investigated in form planet project, the force measurement and cutting processes and the draw in measurement and deep drawing process. At the end of my presentation, I want to give you a short summary and outlook. For the introduction, I want to uh, try to answer two key questions. And one question is, why do we need inline processes monitoring? And what is the benefit of inline process monitoring? So regarding the first question, why do we need inline process monitoring? At the first point, you can increase your process knowledge if you're using inline process monitoring, especially in the field of objectification of empirical knowledge. The second thing is you are able to detect or predict uh, your machine status or the expected component quality. And uh, one uh, thing maybe for the future is the inline process monitoring is more or less one key component for the development of property and part quality controlled forming processes, also called adaptive forming processes. And what do I mean with this? So this means each individual sheet metal component uh, will be manufactured with uh, its individual optimized process parameters. And the benefits from using uh, this method is, method is uh, you do, you, <laughs> reduction of scrap, uh, a faster production ramp up, uh, an effective failure identification and increased tool lifetime. In the frame of Form Planet project uh, from Fraunhofer IWU, we investigated three different methods. One is the force measurement in shear cutting process, the draw in measurement in deep drawing processes, and a non destructive uh, measurement uh, method for uh, yes, detecting material parameters using a 3MA. And the 3MA system is developed by the <coughs> Fraunhofer Institute for Non Destructive Testing. In this presentation, I will focus on the force measurement in shear cutting processes and the drawing measurement in deep drawing processes. 
So now I will come uh, to the fourth measurement in, in cutting processes. And the objective from our investigations were, was, um, are we able to correlate uh, the measured cutting force signals with the status of the punch or the wheel of the punch? And for the experimental, uh, for the experiments, we are using uh, a conventional uh, cutting tool in a high speed uh, uh, press from the company Bruder. Uh, the experiments were realized with an, uh, yes, with an, uh, or were realized from coil with an, uh, with 250 strokes per minute. And as uh, raw material, we used the spring steel with an uh, <coughs> a tensile strength about 180 megapascal, uh, 1,800 megapascal. Um, as measurement approach, we use uh, or integrate four piezoelectrical sensors in the pressure plate of the foaming tool. Um, you will see on the picture on the uh, right hand side of the slide the, the four sensors, yes, uh, highlighted in yellow, and in green, you will see the positions of the punches. And with this uh, mess, or this method has uh, two main advantages. Uh, at the first, we are able to measure the cutting force as directly as, as possible in the, in, the, in the force flow. And on the other hand, uh, this method is easy to, uh, to integrate in already available forming tools. So you only have to replace or have, you have to integrate uh, such sensors in your pressure plate. Uh, the recording of the, the measurement signals was uh, done by a uh, commercial tool monitoring system from the uh, company tier systems. For the experimental uh, work or, or to get some, some first data, we do a comparison of the measured uh, force crank angle curves for a sharp punch and a blunt punch. Um, on the right hand side of the slide, you will see a an, yes, an, an, an picture of the sharp punch, which is uh, used for uh, less than 500 strokes, and the picture of the blunt uh, punch with, uh, was used for more than 100,000 uh, strokes. And on the blunt punch, you will see some adhesion on the on the outer surface and also some some uh, edge edge fractures or edge cracks on the on the cutting edge of the punch and with these two punches we uh, did some experiments and in the in the diagram on the left hand side you will see the the measured uh, cutting force and you will see a significant significant change in the in the signal looking at the the curve from the the sharp punch and the blunt punch so with the with the blunt punch you have a uh, higher uh, maximum force. The maximum force is 26% uh, higher than uh, compared to the, to the uh, sharp punch. And you have a larger area under the curve. So you have to, to put more and more energy in this, in this process. So the, the area under the, the, the curve increases up to, uh, yeah, to, to up to five, uh, 85%. So this method seems to be valid to measure uh, the wear of the tool. Uh, in the next step, we implemented uh, the system and also the analysis method in an <clears throat> in the yes in the tool monitoring system uh, compact press directly. And now we are available to get the data from the actual uh, stroke. You will see it in highlighted in the in the red frame. Um, and here you will see the the measured force over the, the crank angle. And then in the uh, green frame, you will see a statistical analysis over time. In, in this case, the maximal value of the force is plotted. And you will see at the, the first uh, thousand strokes were, were realized with a blunt punch. There you see a really high maximal values. And then we remove the, the tool and change the, the punches and, and integrate a sharp punch. And then you will we will did some some further a thousand strokes, and uh, you will see a yes a significant lower value. So from our point of view, it's a really nice system to to measure or to to monitor the the condition of your of your uh, punch in in cutting processes. Next, I will uh, come to the draw in measurement in deep drawing processes, and the objective of this investigation was. Uh, to check uh, if the draw in measurement is uh, suitable for predicting uh, the material quality. As, is, as the setup uh, for this uh, yes, investigations, we used a laser triangulation system 
to measure the draw in. And for demonstration part, we use uh, a, a generic deep drawing part. Uh, we call it oil pen. And as input material, we are using a code road steel 180 BH, uh, which was provided by a supplier. And we uh, get this material in an OK and not OK condition. And with the OK uh, condition, we are able to uh, form OK parts. This, this means we have no fractures in the parts. And then we are uh, using the not OK material, but do not change some other process parameters like, like blank holder forces or the drawing depth. And with this not OK material, uh, we, we achieved or we, we see some fractures in the part. Um, for the approach of this investigations, uh, at first we did a material characterization of the OK and the not OK material. Uh, at the one hand, for the uh, uh, development of material cards for an uh, FE simulation, and on the other hand, to get a feeling uh, how different the material behavior of these uh, two material uh, is. And you will see the results of uh, tensile tests in the uh, stress strain uh, diagram on the, the right hand uh, side of the slide. And you will see you have uh, a little bit uh, lower, lower stress values uh, for the not okay material and uh, the, the maximum elongation at, at, at failure is uh, a little bit lower uh, for the not okay material. And the next step we are using uh, this uh, developed material cards uh, for the simulative investigation of the laser position. And then we integrate them in our forming tool and, and, and realize the experimental investigations. And last, we did do the data analysis and try to correlate our uh, measure draw and curves with the uh, material condition. So uh, one of the, the key things, if you want to do some, some draw in, in, in measurements and get some, uh, uh, yes, really good ex uh, results, you have to find the, the right position for your laser sensors. So you have to find a, a position on, on, your, on your tool or where, on, on your plank uh, where you have a, a great uh, sensitivity of the, of the draw in of your uh, feature you want to predict. And we did it uh, using FE simulations. And what we did, we uh, do a FE simulation from the forming of the, of the oil panel of, of the demonstrator part uh, using identical. Uh, simulation setups, but uh, changing uh, the material card we used oh, at the one, one time for the OK material and one time for the not OK material. And from those uh, two simulations, we can get uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the simulation the, the draw and values for each point at the, at the, at the boundary of the, of the part. And then we calculate the difference between the the simulated draw and curves from the OK material and the not OK material. And these uh, difference over the, the, the whole part is shown in the diagram on the, on the right hand side of the slide. And uh, you have to, or the, the best thing is to, to integrate the sensors uh, at the positions with the, with the highest difference uh, in, the, in the draw in between the two simulations. And so we integrate the sensors at the, the positions highlighted with the, with the yellow star, uh, only for the one uh, maximum, for the first maximum of the, of the curve, we were not able to, to integrate uh, the sensor at this position in the tool. So we, we have to slightly uh, change the position on, yes, on, in, in this direction. Okay, and then we uh, integrate the lasers, uh, the laser sensors in the tool and uh, measure the, the draw in curve or the, the resulting draw in curves over the, the whole strokes for, for um, 100, 100 parts. And what you will see here, the, the measured uh, draw in curves for the uh, four different sensors and in, in red for the not OK material and in blue for the OK material. And when you are looking on these curves with your, with your naked eye, uh, you will see no significant differences between the OK and the not OK material. So this was the point we decided uh, to use some, uh, yes, some, some, some further uh, methods of, of uh, data analysis. So we try to use an, a machine learning model to predict 
uh, the material condition uh, to and for this we have a data set of 100 ex experimental drawn curves and 24 from not okay part and, and 76 from okay part and as the the diagram on the the left hand side of the slide shows the the input vector for the machine learning model so we uh, take some supporting points of the drawing curve over the over the deep drawing process and uh, we extract some characteristic values uh, for for each sample uh, for example the the value or the maximum value of the of the drawing and with this input data we we trained a, a model in, in this case it was a, a random forest model and uh, the con confusion matrix on the the left hand side on the slide uh, shows the results of of the prediction on the y axis you will see the true label and and the x axis the predicted label and inside these the squares you will see the the classification rate and you will see you will have a correct classification rate for the ok material of 80 percent and the correct classification rate for the not ok material of uh, 93 percent so that are really got uh, good results keeping in mind the the only small data set and for this we are also i also plotted a learning curve uh, for the algorithm um, in the slide and, and in the learning curve it shows how your correct classification rate changes if you change the number of training data and what you will see here if you increase the number of training data the correct classification rate which is the, the green curve increases statically so uh, what we think uh, if we have uh, some more training data we are able to to realize or achieve a correct classification rate in nearly 100 percent so from our point, the drawn measurement in combination with uh, advanced uh, data analysis uh, methods like machine learning is a, is a promising approach for process monitoring. Okay, so now I come to the to the summary and outlook of my presentation uh, regarding the force measurement in shear, shear cutting processes. Uh, we are we qualified an in process force measurement for the predicting of wear of uh, shear cutting punches. And we implemented uh, this system in an industrial tool monitoring system, which is now ready to use. Regarding the drawn measurements, uh, the drawn measurements are a useful method for process monitoring, but you have to keep in mind to find the right positions uh, of your of your measurement system uh, to to get the, the right uh, or the best sensitive sensitivity regarding your your feature you want to predict and some uh, machine learning methods are su suitable for predicting the material quality in this case and as a outlook or what's coming next what we are doing now we try to combining the force measurement and the drawn measurement uh, to develop a smart in process material test so for this we are using a miniaturized uh, forming experiment like in a small uh, bulge test and, and on this use or, or performing this test, we are measure, measuring the, the drawn and also the force and try to predict the material quality using this input data. At uh, the moment, uh, we are using the system in a, in a standalone, uh, standalone machine at Fraunhofer IWU, but we are also, but the system can also be integrated in, uh, yes, in line in, in some forming tools. So now I finished my presentation. Thank you, thank you for your uh, kind attention. And I think we will. I can answer a question at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, thank you, Matthias. And uh, now our final speaker is Linda Bacci, who is a researcher at uh, Letomec. She has a master's degree in mechanical engineering at the University of Pisa, and her research fields are hydrogen embrittlement, material testing, and material characterization. So before um, she could start, uh, the title is Industrial Diffusible Hydrogen Measurement for Online Hydrogen Embrittlement Risk Assessment. And uh, we have solved the technical problems here, but what you have to do, Linda, is give us just a thumbs up or hint when we should change the slide. So, oh, Linda, let's move on. 
thank you, Jorgen. <clears throat> okay, I will ask for a change next slide. So, uh, next slide, please. I think that we can move to the core of the presentation, keeping the agenda, since I've already said what we are going to present today. Uh, next slide. Uh, restart from the problem of hydrogen enrichment in uh, automotive industry. Uh, all of you already know that the recent environmental restrictions are requiring severe reduction in the emission of greenhouse gases and gases. Moreover, the automotive industry is always facing the cost reduction and cost sustainability, so they always check for improved material to reduce the weight of, vehicle, of vehicles. But this is um, related to the problematic that uh, the agar is the steel grade and the agar is expected to be the hydrogen enrichment suitability of the material. So it's now becoming essential to control and monitor the hydrogen pickup during the production. So next slide, please. During the part production, we have many phases where the steel or the metal in general can absorb hydrogen. For example, it can be absorbed from the liquid metal phase during the material production through several electrolytic processes like the pickling process or the coating application. Then we also have some thermal treatments for example for the press hardening field like the hot stamping phase and then we also have the vehicle life where any part can be exposed to corrosive environment all these contributions give a cumulative effect on the material and in general to the hydrogen treatment problem next slide please to perform the measurement of hydrogen inside the metal there are several uh, technologies available on the market, and the most of them are dedicated to laboratory investigation. Because if you look at the slide, here we have the mercury audiometer, the mass spectrometer, and also the thermal desorption analyzer. All these technologies um, return very good values and very uh, reliable results, but they need time consuming sample preparation and also the test duration is very long. For all these reasons, they are good for laboratory investigation, but not applicable for the industrial quality control. Next slide, please. If you also consider the barnacle electrode method that was developed for, for the measurement of uh, diffusible hydrogen in cadmium plated components, it also presents some limitation. For example, uh, it, it needs the electrochemical cell for the measurement. It, it, it performs the test at room temperature. And so we can have an uh, underestimation of the component of the, um, uh, of the amount of hydrogen measurement, measured for incomplete desorption. And then you also have to consider that the measurement is destructive because if you have uh, a coating on the metal, you have to remove it before to perform the measurement. For all the re these reasons, um, we have, as LATMEC, developed a new methodology and a new equipment that is dedicated to industrial workforce. And during the project, the, the Form Planet Horizon project, we have significantly improved our uh, technology uh, to overcome all these limitations that you have seen in this traditional methodology. Next slide, please. What we think about the Helios 4 hot probe method? We think that it is the evolution of the thermal desorption analysis and so also of the hot gas extraction method, but applied to finished components. We have developed this methodology, especially for the automotive and also steel making industry, to perform the plant control at plant level, the control uh, of diffusible hydrogen inside the components or the coil. Next slide, please. What we like to say is also the operative concept behind this novel technology. 
we think about values for hot probe as a traffic light. So first of all, you have to perform the characterization of the material that you would like to investigate, determining the subjectability of this material to hydrogen enrichment. So you have to um, define a curve like the one on the right of the slide. Together with the, the customer, we can define three areas that can define the condition of the material when it's safe, when you have the transition of the behavior of the material from ductile to brittle, and then you have the red area, which is um, the bad condition and unsafe area. If you measure something during the production uh, that is in the red area, you of course have to perform some corrective action to your process line uh, because you are risking for hydrogen enrichment in your product productive components. Next slide, please. Summarizing in a few words, the Helios 4 hot probe is designed to perform uh, fast measurement, non-destructive measurement, and can be applied on the line. So to perform measurement on coil or also on components that are um, already produced. And is functioning as a traffic light, perform, um, giving the result as a green light, so the, the process is under control, or the red light, the process should be monitored and uh, something should be changed. Next slide, please. Within the Form Planet project, we have, I have uh, as I have already said, there are some uh, improvement to the equipment that can be summarized uh, in this uh, slide. We have a new portable equipment that can be can perform non-destructive measurement and can be applied directly on also on coated alloys. We have equipped the, the, the instrument with a high sensitivity sensor, and we also have improved the part dedicated to industry 4.0. So uh, we are ready also to perform some automatization of uh, some specific industrial activities. Next slide, please. Within Form Planet, after the upgrade of the equipment, we also have performed the validation of the equipment at the laboratory scale. In this case, we have performed some repeat repeatability measurements uh, performing the test with Helios for Otpo and with a traditional uh, TDA equipment to assess the use of Helios 4 Otpo for the industrial case studies. In this case, we have used one of the material that was under investigation in the project, that was the, the Usibor 2000, and we found a very good correlation among the measurement of Helios 4 Otpo and traditional <coughs> techniques. Sorry. So um, after this uh, validation of laboratory scale, we have prepared, prepared the instrument for the industrial use. Next slide. Uh, still within the project, we have performed a couple of case studies. The first one uh, was uh, for CRF, so for Stellantis, and was dedicated to the uh, assessment of the implementation of a new material in their production line. Uh, I think that both of these uh, industrial cases will be uh, defined later from the presentation of some of our colleagues. The second one was realized uh, instead in the, in the frame of the Open Call initiative that was carried out during the project and was dedicated <clears throat> to one of the parts of magnet automotive production. Um, in this case, we perform a check of the condition of their production to assess um, if the, there is the risk for hydrogen enrichment, but uh, of course they are applying the control of the atmosphere inside the hot stamping furnace, and we didn't find any problem in their production. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, okay. Uh, the final thing that was developed during the project was, as already mentioned before from Javier, um, a CWA dedicated uh, to our techniques. 
in particular with the support of the Spanish Association for Standardization UNE that involves the relevant technical committee, we have published this document that is named Measurement of Diffusible Hydrogen in Metallic Materials, Helios for Hot Probe Method. And this document is now available to read also online. So summarizing next slide, please. I think we can move to the conclusion of this presentation. We can say that diffusible hydrogen content can be measured directly on components at industrial scale, and the hydrogen pickup can be monitored by a non-destructive technology and method. Moreover, um, we have implemented some Industry 4.0 features that could allow the procedure to be automatized for some specific industrial controls. Thank you for your attention. My presentation is ended. So, uh, thank you very much, Linda. Time's flying and we have some time for questions. So, uh, I will take the first one from Ponelara um, at Erukat. Uh, it's addressed for you, Matthias. Is there any limitation in force measuring in chair cutting process? For example, minimum punch diameter. So in, in this case, we, we tested <coughs> using only one, one punch diameter. Uh, so we are, we are measuring not, not direct in the force flow, but, but near, near the, the, the punches. And I think if we, we use smaller punches or punches with a with smaller punch diameter, the, the changes in the signal should not be that high, but I think we, we could use it, we could use it as well. Also for, for smaller punches. Thank you very much. Uh, I ha we have time for one more question, but the thing is, uh, I can't really answer it because it's more, uh, more or less addressed for the edge cracking modeling, but I will read it anyway. Uh, it's a very relevant question. Uh, how do you account for damage introduced by sharing punching? Is there a pre-damage in the whole expansion test and the uh, dome, this dome test? And uh, it's uh, also from ASO at SEMA at uh, Tata Steel Europe. Uh, if you want, I can send that question to Ricardo Hernandez at Ericat, and he will answer it as soon as he can. Yeah. And uh, I think that was the final part of session two. Uh, next session starts at the quarter past two. It will be on materials data traceability and process optimization. The chairman will be the coordinator of this form planet, that is Edward Garris. So please. Uh, have half an hour lunch and then we meet again. Thank you very much. Thank you.